Welcome to Notre Dame fans to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I am Vince D'Addario. I am the football analyst here at irishbreakdown.com. And with me, as always, is the publisher of irishbreakdown.com. That's Brian Driscoll. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Doing great. Ready to talk some football. You know, that always gets me in a good mood. Yeah, man. So uh, we are jumping in with both feet first uh, back into our spring previews. We're going position by position. And uh, today's position is tight ends. And... This has been, obviously, a position of strength for Notre Dame. Uh, you know, tight end you, mm-hmm. O-line you, those are positions of strength for Notre Dame. And so these are the fun ones to talk about. Um, and for the first time, we are talking about a position group where the starter is the one that is returning. And so let's talk about Michael Mayer and what he was able to bring to the table last year and how we want to see another step. Uh, from Michael Mayer this year you know it's 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 kind of you know you talked about tight end you and you think about all the great tight ends that have come through Notre Dame just in the last 12 years forget sure. history when we start talking about Dave Casper and Mark Bavaro and and Derek Jones or excuse me Derek Brown and, and Herb Smith and all, Oscar McBride all these great tight ends that, that played at Notre Dame just the last 12 years really starting with Kyle Rudolph, and you look at Kyle Rudolph and Tyler Eifert and then Troy Nicholas and then Ben Koyak, Alizé Jones, Durham Smythe, um, Alizé Mack, because remember he was Alizé Jones as a freshman. I remember. And then he was Alizé Mack later. Uh, Cole Komet. And, and so you just watch. And then, of course, Michael Mayer. And none of them, none of those guys we just mentioned came anywhere close to the product production as a freshman that that Michael Mayer had this past year. Correct. And not only was that impressive, but he did it at a position where it's not like they needed a freshman to come into play. He he had to earn that playing time and he was just that good. And yeah. And and to watch him come in, and the thing that I liked about him as a freshman Vince and we'll kind of dive into the expectations for him here in the spring and in the next season was there's a couple things you notice about him. Number one, physically he looks like a veteran. He doesn't he, he you know he's not your you know, your typical tight, you know, freshman tight end that needs that right. year to develop. He's physically ready to play. The other thing I like about it is he showed a lot of mental maturity and toughness. You know, you think about some of the things that he went through a couple times this year, a lesser player might have allowed that to really bother him. And I and I think of the of the Clemson game. Yep. First and the foremost. two huge mistakes he made in that game. You had a drop that would have gone for a touchdown, and then you had the false start that negated another touchdown. But it, it didn't affect him. It's not that it didn't bother him. I'm sure it bothered him, but it didn't sure. affect him. He, he, it didn't. What can often happen with veterans, much less freshmen, is you make a couple big mistakes and then it compounds. You, you know, you either a you lose your confidence, or right. b you want to make up for it so bad that you then press and you make another mistake. Yep. With Michael Mayer, it's like you know, it, it just kind of he's kind of got this look on his face all the time of just like, yeah, okay, I'm good. I got this. And then he went out and just kept making some big plays in that game. Right. And, and that was an, an impressive part. And the other thing that st- stood out to me was, you know, when you think Michael Mayer and you look at him, you think, you know, throwback tight end, you know, 6'5", 240, big, strong, muscular kid, strong, tough, all that stuff. But he is he is probably the best tight end they've had as a freshman. He's the best tight end that I can think of when it comes to after the catch. And I'm not talking about like the stuff Cole Komet did. I, I think of that play against Georgia. It was like nine dudes trying to bring him down. Remember that play? I do. We caught that ball. I think it was a crossing route. Might have been a play up. To, I think it was a crossing route. And it was like nine dudes jumped on his back and they still couldn't bring him down. Uh, and that was against Georgia. Michael Mayer can do that, I'm sure. I mean, especially if he gets older. But it's I'm talking about making people miss. Right. He, uh, he leapt over a guy, I believe. Yeah. I mean, he, there was one got, where he like danced the sideline. I yeah. mean, so yeah. like there was a play last night. I was breaking down the the uh, the all twenty two of the Clemson ACC title game, and one of the catches he made early in the game, he's running outside and he stops, and the guy kind of runs by him and he cuts back inside, and you're like, tight ends aren't supposed to be able to move right. like that. Exactly. But it's also about great balance. It's not just about foot quickness, but it's about great balance. But he has such an incredible feel for the game as well. And so he he just was one of the most advanced freshmen I've ever seen at Notre Dame, regardless of position. Just mentally, physically, emotionally, just being able to handle sure. everything that the team went through last year on and off the field. And a steadiness to him. 
You know, there, there just was a level of steadiness to where it wasn't like he ever had that bad game where it's like, oh, yeah, he looked like a freshman. He had a couple – we talked about a couple freshman moments against Clemson, but then he bounced back and played well. Yeah, he had a great second half. So those are the things you look at, Vince, and you say this is a kid that that just has – you talk about that it factor. I mean, he's not the fastest tight end Notre Dame's had in recent – he wasn't even the fastest tight end on the team last year, you know, and, and he's not the biggest tight end that Notre Dame's ever had. He's not – He's not the best athlete that Notre Dame's ever had at tight end. There's just something about this kid that makes him the best tight end that Notre Dame's ever had as a freshman uh, in my lifetime, and it's not even really close from a production standpoint, sure. from a big game standpoint. There's just never been a moment where you're like, yeah, the the the, the, the spotlight got too big for him at, at that time. He just he – just, Again, week after week, Vince just stepped up. The, and he did it in the opener. I mean, he just made a couple of plays against Duke. You're like, oh, okay. Michael Mayer's already made his presence felt. This is going to be fun to watch. So you, you've anointed him as the best freshman tight end in your lifetime. I would agree. I mean, you, combining production plus. No, I got, I mean, absolutely. No, I get it. Absolutely. I, so, But that begs the question, what's next? What's the next step for Michael Mayer? I mean – you, you don't want to see him plateau as a freshman, sure. right? You want to see him continue to get better. So what's the next step as a sophomore? You know, I, I do think we have to ask the question of how much better can he get? Sure. That, not that I'm saying he can't, but I, I think when you look at how advanced he was, you always have to wonder, like, how much more chiseled yeah. is he going to get? You know, how much bigger yeah. is he going to get? Is he going to get in faster? Those kind of things. So I think those are valid questions to say, does he have the same sort of growth potential that we saw from Tyler Eifert? Who again? The reason I say best freshman. Well, Tyler Eifert didn't play as a freshman, right? You know, he redshirted. He was still kind of a growing wide receiver that that continued to develop. You know, is Michael Mayer going to make those same kind of physical jumps? I don't know. So that's yeah. kind of what we need to see. I don't think he's going to necessarily get a whole lot bigger and stronger and those kind of things. But I think there's a lot of room for him to continue developing as a player, especially as a blocker. I think that's the biggest thing, and I think that's where that weight room strength, that extra year of weight room strength should help him. Uh, Cause I, I don't believe he was an early, he was not an early enrollee last year and it wouldn't have mattered if he was because they were only yeah. on campus for a couple months. Right. But I think there's a, a certainly another level of weight room strength that can be gained there. And, and there's a lot of technique work needed. You know, the thing I liked about Michael as a blocker was he was, ne it was never a question about effort or willingness to block. Agreed. He's more than willing to mix it up. He's a tough kid. It's just, he doesn't. He still. He was still a freshman in the weight room, right? Uh, going against a lot of times veterans, and he was a guy that still needs to work on technique. And technique is about it's like leverage. It's about footwork. You know, if you come off and you smash a guy, and and, and you're face to face with him, but you're supposed to be on that upfield shoulder, he's going to beat you. And I don't care how tough you are, I don't care how strong you're, he's he's going to beat you unless you hold him. So it's you know those would be the things when he would lose a guy. It was he would smash a guy, and he'd have the right angle, but he'd stop his feet. And then that allows that guy to recover, a veteran to recover. So just like little technical things well, like that that aren't, aren't hard to teach, Vince, but it takes some experience to, to put, you know, make those things as part of your game. And I wasn't expecting a, any freshman to, to well, like walk on campus and have that. And that's the thing. As a, as a senior in high school, you know, going into your freshman year of college, he didn't have to be perfect in technique yeah. to dominate the kids that he was going up against in high school. He was just a physical specimen, right? I mean, and right. so th there is a learning curve there. And, and again, it's nothing against Michael Mayer. It's just a fact that some of those things just have to be worked out. Let's not also forget that Michael mm -hmm. Mayer for three years in a row in high school was a first team all state defensive player once as a defensive end, twice as a linebacker. So this was a kid who was playing both ways. Sure. Sure. And so that's always gonna, on, yeah. Right. Exactly. So that that is those are the areas where I think that growth can continue to happen. And and as he gets more mature as a player, you always see this with freshmen, no matter how advanced they are. There's there's little tricks he's gonna learn. Like, you sure. know, hey, I, I struggle to get open with this route. So let me learn some tricks that allows me to kind of work against this. Hey, you know, safeties tend to give me more problems because they can run with me. So now I need to maybe better utilize my size. You know, linebackers can muscle with me, but they can't run with me. So there's all those types of little nuances that he'll learn. And that's the in intriguing part about him is he had 42 catches for 450 yards last year. 
And you're saying, well, you know, he's got to get better. Well, I mean, that's pretty freaking good. Yeah. But so I think it's those little things, those nuances, the the weight room strength, the technique things. I, I think he was advanced for a freshman as a route runner. But again, advanced for a freshman doesn't mean you're advanced for a senior. So that's another part of the technical game. If he doesn't get an ounce better, if he doesn't get a, a, a split second faster, a tenth of a second faster, a hundredth of a second faster than the 40, if his bench press doesn't improve one ounce, if he if if he makes no physical gains whatsoever, but improves the technical part of his game, you're gonna see a jump sure. for Michael Mayer in year two. Yep. And, and so the question that I have when I talk about getting better is more of a what will the gap be between when he's a well, let's be honest, uh, a, a rookie in the NFL, and when Cole Komet was a senior and you know or you know junior and actually no Cole Komet left early. Tyler Eifert, I think it'd be a good example. You know, Tyler Eifert, by the time he was a senior, was so much bigger and stronger and, sure. and had, had developed physically. I don't know if Michael Mayer can make those same kind of physical jumps because the baseline was already so good. Yeah. But the technical jumps are what's going to determine how much better he can be from year one to year three. And, and that's the thing Notre Dame fans have to kind of wrap their head around. Barring some kind of injury or setback, you're going to have them for two more years, so enjoy it. Yeah. You know, uh, and so I think the, the the bar for him now, Vince, isn't, you know, where does he stack up from a Notre Dame standpoint? The bar for me is where does he – is he going to stack up in 2021 from a best tight end in the nation standpoint? Sure. Because I think already as a sophomore – with his talent, with his when it, with his production, and with an offense that likes to use tight ends, he has an opportunity to go into 2021 and be contending for the best tight end in the country. Especially since a lot of the best tight ends from this past season all are now in the NFL. Kyle Pitts is in the NFL. Hunter Long's in the NFL. Uh, Brevin Jordan's in the NFL now, or heading to the NFL draft. Sure. So he has an opportunity, in my opinion, to emerge as as arguably the best tight end in the nation. I think that's the bar that I set for him as a sophomore, which is saying a lot because I'm usually someone who likes to say, hey, let's pump the brakes on putting the hype on this young player. But that's kind of where I feel. I mean, he was so much more advanced than even Kyle Hamilton was as a freshman. And we saw what kind of production Kyle Hamilton had in year two. So I think that, to me, that's the conversation we need to be having about, about Michael Mayers. How's he going to stack up against the best tight ends in the nation? Forget you know, how he stacks up against other Notre Dame tight ends and things along those lines. One of the things we like to do, Brian, is we like to talk about what was lost from last year's team. And usually we lead off with what was lost because it's usually a starter or uh, you know, somebody along those lines. And if you're not looking at the depth chart that Notre Dame handed out, uh, because that did not have Michael Mayer as the starter. Um, it, it had Brock Wright as the starter mm-hmm. all year. But uh, they, they lose Tommy Tremble. They lose Brock Wright. They lose Tommy Tremble um, early, uh, and they lose Brock Wright because he was out of eligibility. They had the COVID year and all that, but he, he was ready to move on. Um, and so that's what they're losing. So they're losing their number two and their number three tight end, which is a pretty big loss. Mm-hmm. Um, that. That is where kind of all the question marks begin uh, for this tight end position. But let's let's specifically focus on uh, what was lost with Tremble and Wright. I think with Tremble, you lose just a ferocious blocker. Yes. You know, we've talked about this when we're talking about uh, the NFL draft. And, and he was just such a, a versatile blocker as well. I think that's the other part of it is, is sometimes we can get wrapped up on the highlight real nature of his blocking and we forget about how – versatile he was as a blocker i mean he was a guy that could put on the edge and he could block a nine technique he was a guy that they could you know send from you know front side action to back side to secure you know the cutback lanes he was a guy that did a lot of the counter blocking you know he was a guy that uh was one of the well, he would be the rapper you know you have a kick out and then the wrap on a counter play he'd be the rapper which means he's getting up to that second level looking for linebackers looking for work on the second level um, he was a guy that bl- had to block the edge, uh, you know, on some of their G scheme stuff, which requires a very strong firm block. And then, of course, he would block a lot on the perimeter. So uh, they would put him at fullback at times as, as well. And, and there's just so much versatility to how they could use him. And I don't know if 
you know, I think a lot of times, Vince, we look at this and say, well, how do you replace Tommy Trumbull? Well, I don't think you try to replace Tommy Trumbull with how Tommy Trumbull played the game. Sure. You have to try to replace that number two tight end with whoever your number two tight end is and, and build around their strengths. Stop looking for the next Tommy Trumbull because that doesn't really there's exist. There's nobody else on the roster that's yeah. going to do that. Now, right. I've compared Kane Barong to, to Tommy Trumbull, and, and we'll, we'll chat about him here in a second. But even there, he's a freshman. Sure. You know, Tommy Trumbull was a, saw, a junior this past year. So I don't think Notre Dame is in a situation where they need to try to replace Tommy Trumbull. They just got to figure out a way to get their their talented tight ends on the field because there's just not they're just not going to replace that. It's just you had a unique weapon there. And, and I would even argue that the fact that they misused him last year in the pass game negates how big of a loss he actually is because if they would have used him more effectively in the past game like they should have and we'll get into that here stay tuned to the end of the show because we're going to talk about how Notre Dame uses their tight ends it would have been a much bigger loss and and the same thing with Brock Wright like Brock Wright I think is a talented kid and and had he not spent his whole career behind you know Durham Smythe and Alizé Mack and Cole Komet and now Michael Mayer Tommy Trumbull he he you know, there's a lot of places Brock Wright starting. There's a there's a lot of schools in the ACC Absolutely. and all over Brock Wright to starter. So he's getting NFL interest right now, sure. and, and that's the that's the interesting thing about that is he was their third tight. He was the Notre Dame's third tight end his entire career, and he's he's going to be on an NFL. You know, somebody's going if if he doesn't get drafted, he's which I don't know if he will. He's definitely getting signed by somebody, and that just speaks to the depth that Notre Dame has a tight end. But again, yeah, it gives him the opportunity to to make a team. I mean, right? Getting into camp is step one, right? So. But they didn't utilize him really as a weapon, right? I so agree. I don't think the loss of Tremble and and especially Brock Wright is going to be as great as their talent would otherwise lead you to believe. I think that obviously you lost that unique blocking aspect of it, but I don't think that you can necessarily say well they're not going to continue to be a good running team because they don't have Tommy Trumbull. You just do right. it differently. Yes. And I think that's going to be the key. But talent-wise, they lost two good football players. Run game-wise, they lost one of their best blockers. Fortunately for the 2021 team, they didn't use either one of those guys nearly as effectively as they should have in the past game, which, I mean, Tommy Trumbull caught eight passes the first two games, caught 11 the next 10 so you're not really using losing that part of what you what you brought to the table, which we could we're going to argue here, talk about in a second. But when you project to 2021, it should make it easier for the returning players to replace the pass game production. First of all, Michael Mayer is going to get some of that, <laughs> right? Right. And second of all, I think that guy, the guys on the roster, George Takis, Kevin Bauman, Kane Barong, uh, even Mitchell Evans to a degree, there's enough players there that they can replace the. 22 catches that they lost pretty easily from Tommy actually. Trumbull and 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 uh and Brock Wright and and that's uh, you know kudos to the job that they did recruiting that you can lose two guys that are going to probably be playing in the NFL next year and still say we're going to be all right because you've done such a good job recruiting that your roster's pretty set let put it this way there's no one on Notre Dame schedule that's looking at their tight end depth chart saying I feel bad for them Boy, you know, lost Tremble and Brock Wright. They're going to be in trouble. No, they're saying, how do they still have that much talent at tight end after losing Tommy Tremble and Brock Wright? That's the conversation that people are having. So the future is certainly looking bright. This is a position as much as any other events where they are so prepared to handle the departures uh, that it's it's almost it's almost like it comes across as disrespectful to the players they lost to to just be like, uh, yeah, eh, it'll be okay. And yeah. I don't mean it that way because they're both good football players. It's just a matter of how stacked the guys are that are still in that room. Yeah. That, no, those guys got to prove themselves. Sure. Right? They got to sure. prove themselves. But, um, uh, <clears throat> and I also think the depth at receiver and the depth at running back also factors into this as, two, as well, Vince, it's because true, yeah. if your number two and number three tight ends don't step up to the level that you feel you can play them as much as you did last year, fine. Do two more two back. You know, get Kyron Williams and Chris Tyree on the field more. Fine. Do more three receiver. Do more 11 personnel. I'm, right. I'm fine with that, you know. Uh, and, and I would like to see some of that anyway, which we'll get into. I'm teasing the heck out of the, the ending of our show. You really are. It on purpose. Uh, it's just one of those things where the, the unique part of that position is not like a left tackle, where if you don't have a second left tackle, you just sub out a receiver. 
No, you need five blockers, right? Right. But if you can't do as much 12 and 13 personnel with two and three tight ends, that's fine. Just play more receivers, play more running backs. And so that's the thing is even if those guys don't step up, you're still okay because there's other personnel things you can do to protect yourself at that position and still have a very talented group of players on the field. And so, Vince, that kind of leads us into breaking down those three players. And when we kind of kicked off the offseason, one of the first things we did is we talked about predicting breakout players. Yep. And you went a completely different direction than I thought we were going to go with those breakdowns. Your breakout player was George Takis, which I think makes it pretty appropriate that we're, we bring that up now because th- this is a big spring for him. He's a senior. Yep. He has a tremendous opportunity. And I don't think a lot of people appreciate how good this kid is. And and we've seen a little bit of it on games, but you you're taste. more basing this <laughs> off of what we've seen from him in in spurts during practice. But tell me, tell us why you have such a high expectation for George Takis to where, you know, I think you even more than me are in sort of that they're going to be fine at tight end next year. And because of, of the confidence you have in George Takis. Yeah, no, I, I feel very confident in George Tagus. And like you said, we've seen bits and pieces in a game. I thought that when he went in, it was the Alabama game, right? That that he went in, um, they just ignored him, it felt like. You know, he I think he had what one catch, but he was open a lot mm-hmm. more often. And I felt oh, like yeah. he could have really been an integral part of that game plan. Now, obviously, he wasn't part of the game plan going in, but once he's in. You, they, they didn't utilize him at all. You could just and, plug and play with him to a degree. It's like, yeah, yeah okay, so and so's down, but you know, George exactly. can do all the things that we were asking that guy to do. And I, and I felt like that was a bit of a missed opportunity uh, by Notre Dame in that game. And and you mentioned it. We we've seen highlights of him in practice, um, you know, and and what he's able to do. I feel like his time is now. I mean, he's ready to kind of step up and take that that number two tight end role and just run with it. And I. I feel very confident in his blocking ability. I feel very confident in his route running. Um, I, I feel very confident in his hands. I just, I just feel like he, there's going, there's not going to be much of a drop off uh, from the production standpoint. You, mm-hmm. I mean, you said it yourself. The twenty-two receptions is what they're trying to replace. Right. I would put even money that George Takis would have no problem getting twenty-two receptions next season. I, I would have no problem with that. Now. A lot of that is going to have to do with how they use their tight ends, which we're going to talk about. But does he have the ability to be that a 22 catch guy as the number two tight end? Uh, yeah, no problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm very excited about what he can do. And he's really, he has, he could have transferred a long time ago, Brian. And I think he's stuck it out for all the right reasons. I think he's got his opportunity now as a senior. He's a redshirt junior. So he's got two years of eligibility left as well. Um, I think that he could be somebody that we're talking about. I mean, that could be one heck of a one-two punch with, with Mayer and Takis over the next two years. For me, I, I agree with everything you said about his physical talent. I think he's 6'6", 245. He, he's surprisingly athletic. I, yeah. I think, you know, he his if you want to see how athletic he is, go watch the touchdown grab he had against Duke two years ago. It was Notre Dame's last touchdown where he was able to flip his hips on a ball that wasn't exactly well thrown use like his really long arms to go make that grab. And it was a really impressive catch. He's a very good athlete. And we've seen him in practice just, I mean, just make play after play at times. Here's where I am concerned about George Takis. I have zero doubt about his physical tools. And if he is locked in and putting in the work and confident, he's going to, to your point, he's the kind of guy that, that even if Michael Mayer, for some reason, was not in the lineup, I'd be like, they're, they're fine. They're, yeah. they're going to be okay. That kid's really good. My issue, however, is with his own confidence in himself. I think that's where George Takis has had issues in the past. Is he would you know, remember earlier we're talking about how when Michael Mayer made mistakes, he did, didn't let him bother yeah. him. George Takis has been sort of the opposite when he was younger. He would make a mistake and then it would just get on him so bad he that done. he would then it would start compounding mistake after mistake after mistake, and then he would lose confidence in himself. So that to me is my only concern for George Takis is. Number one, is he going to be healthy, which is a concern for every player that's looking to, to get into that. But number two is, does he have as much confidence in his abilities that you have in his ability that I have in his ability? I think that's going to be the big question for me. And if he does and he plays confidently and he sees his hold of it, to, to your point, 
the opportunity's in front of him. Yeah, He's it's right there. season now, though. It's right there. Because there's going to be a couple younger players going to be breathing sure. down his neck. And and I don't know how you know how long you're going to want to wait for him to to step up and make make that seize seize hold of that position. And so uh, that's the only question mark for me is, is how does it, I mean when you're when you got the potential to go to two tight end sets and your smallest guy is Michael Mayer that that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an impressive kind of deal. So uh, I think he's a key guy. I'm just I'm just I need to see him play with confidence on a consistent basis before I'm ready to anoint him as sort of that next up and coming you know, impactful player. I mean, honestly, I could see him. I could see him easily replacing the production they lost by himself. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes, and absolutely. and be even. I mean, they only the the, <clears throat> the the other two tight ends didn't score a single touchdown last year, and and only averaged about 11 yards a catch because of the way that they were used. There's no way that 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 George Takis couldn't replicate and outperform that production if given the opportunity, assuming he plays with confidence. That's the big key. If he plays with confidence. People are around the country like, who is this guy? Yeah. Like, where did he come from? Yeah. Where's you know? he? How's he been on the roster for the last three years? We didn't know right. anything about him. Right. right. And I and I I'm excited about him. I think this is a is a perfect opportunity for him. Um, but let's let's talk about the other the the guy you you mentioned it, some young guys nipping at his heels, whereas if his confidence level isn't where it's supposed to be, there's guys waiting in the wings yeah. to kind of take that number two spot. And that that conversation starts with sophomore Kevin Bauman, I would yeah. imagine. So let's let's hear about Kevin Bauman. I like Kevin Bauman a lot. I think he's a really tough. I mean, he's a New Jersey kid, right? I mean, he's got that attitude, that toughness. He's a quality athlete, and he, to me, if it wasn't for Michael Mayer, he's a guy that we'd be talking about as you know maybe someone that would have played more as a freshman. He's a talented player. He's, you sure. know, doesn't have the size of of Michael Mayer or George Takis, but. He's a really nuanced route runner. I think he's got good hands. He's tough. He played was a really good defensive end in high school. There's a lot to like about Kevin Bauman. I mean, he just I think the only thing he's really lacking is just great size, but he he's kind of in that Tommy Tremble mold of from a body type standpoint. If if he kind of takes over that role of that diverse blocker that we saw from Tommy Tremble this year, I wouldn't be shocked by it. I don't think he's going to block with the ferocity that Tommy Tremble did, but he's athletic well, enough to do the wrapping. Will. Yeah, he, he's got the athleticism to be sort of that counter blocker from the backside. I think he's got that quickness and speed to to be a lead blocker, sort of like that fullback type of position. I could certainly, it's like an H-back type thing. I could certainly see him playing that role. And I think he's got some ability as a pass game back. He's not really a stretch the field type of pass catcher. He's sort of a, a, a you know, as a pass catcher, he's probably more in the Brock Wright mold. As a blocker, right. he's more in the Tommy Trumbull mold, if that if that kind of makes sense. And that's where I see his opportunity this year is, is a guy that can, can move around, can play some attached, can play in the slot in certain situations, but he's going to be that, that third and sixth weapon. You know, like, hey, he's going to go out there and get open. He's going to run a route. He's going to use his leverage. He's going to make a tough contested catch. There's the tools to really be that, you know, 11, 12 yards per catch guy, move the change. You know, he catches eight balls next year. Six of them go for first downs or something like that. Like, that's right. the kind of guy I could see him being. And then if George Takis doesn't step up, I, I, I would have no doubt that Kevin Bauman's going to have the opportunity to step into that number two role. But he is also in the same situation that George Takis is in and that there are, there are some talented younger players in a roster nipping at their heels. So even for a guy like Michael Mayer, there can be no relaxing. Right. There can be no complacency because of the depth of this, of this depth chart. <laughs> We're a little redundant there. Because of the depth of, the, of that position group, there's talent. There's guys that can play. There's third and four string tight ends that there's a lot of teams that Notre Dame's going to play this year that say, can we just have one of those guys, please? Like just one. <laughs> sure. We don't want to be greedy. We just want one. And then those guys will go there and play. And that's what you have to really like about this depth chart is, is you have to – all everybody has to be hungry. If you're not hungry, if you're not willing to go put into work daily basis, there's guys that can pass you up. And that includes Michael Mayer. I'm not – I don't think it's going to happen because everything I've ever heard about him is he's a very driven young man. He wants to be the best. And so I don't think he's going to be like, oh, I'm starter. I'm here, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that, that Kevin Bauman's a guy that's going to have a chance this spring if he can stay healthy to go out there and start making a name for himself. And he's got some really unique tools that allow them to utilize it. And even if George Tacka steps up, he's kind of guy that you could say, okay, they can still do those three tight end stuff because he can take on that Brock Wright mold 
and maybe be even a little bit more, uh, you know, effective in the pass game. Not effective, utilized more in the pass game. I think is a better way I'd like to say that. So, yeah, I think there's an opportunity. If Kevin Bauman steps up and George Takis steps up, you start feeling really good about, about where you are, and we haven't even started talking about Kane Barong yet. Well, Brian, I know you're high on Kane Barong. He's one of the incoming freshmen uh, that are is going to really solidify this depth chart uh, at the tight end position. Um, and then, of course, there's Mitchell Evans as well. But but I know you really want to talk about Kane Barong and, and what he brings to the table because as a true freshman, look, we've already seen a true freshman do some pretty amazing things at Notre Dame at from the tight end position. Not expecting that necessarily from Kane Barong, but there's a lot of talent sure. there to talk about. The, the interesting thing about Kane is is it, it, he is – first of all, Notre Dame listed him, I think, on signing day at like 215 pounds. He's not 215 pounds. He's up over 240. He's kind of between 235 and 242. Uh, so there's the size there. And the thing I liked about him when I first watched him play is I when he first committed Notre Dame, he was listed at like 6'4", like 215, 220. So when I popped on the film, I was expecting to see a guy that was going to be lined up in the slot, doing a lot of things that Cole sure. Komet was doing young in his saw as a saw. Cole Komet was a wide receiver up until I think like part of his junior year of high school. He was a tall, skinny kid, and then filled out. I was expecting to see that. And I saw a guy that looked a lot like Tommy Tremble in, in high school from a blocking standpoint. Like, how's this this guy is a ferocious blocker, a physical blocker, likes to block. And because of the offense he played in, he had to do it a lot, you know, so the way that he was used. But he's a unique guy, and then he can line up attached, and, and he can line up as a wing. He can line up as a fullback. My only question about Kane Barong is I don't know if he can do the attached stuff as a true freshman. Okay. Uh, you know, weight room-wise, size, and strength-wise. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. Having said that, he is an early enrollee, and, and I think that by the time we get to the fall, because this is a spring preview, right? Yes. By the time we get to the fall, I, I think that he'll have the time, because he'll have then by that point, I'm going to have eight whole months in the strength program. I think he'll be in better position to to do those things as a freshman. So if the tight end depth chart wasn't as deep as it is of returners, I, we'd be talking about Kane Barong being a guy that there's a, is a no-brainer going to play as a freshman type of guy. Sure. And I still think even with the depth, I think Kane Barong is going to make it hard to keep him off the field. He's got He's also got exceptional hands, and, and that's the thing that stands out to me. And, and what I mean by that is it doesn't always mean, okay, a guy has, you know, can catch the ball real strong. I mean – there's so many things that go into it. Timing. You know what? What's your timing like as a pass catcher? Meaning, I teach any teach, coach teaches DBs to, you know, you're going to play the eyes and hands of the guy that you're guarding, sure. right? And a lot of receivers, especially tight ends, kind of like to get their hands out early and kind of wait on the ball. What I love about Kane Barong is he's running, 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 and he just shoots his hand at the ball real quick. You can't play that. I mean, if right. you're a defender, you can't play that. You don't have the reaction time to play that. Because you're not looking at the quarterback, you're looking right. at the receiver, and you right. have to go off of what the receiver gives you. Yeah, and he's got really good yeah. body control. He's got fast hands. He's got strong hands. He tracks the ball well. He just wasn't utilized enough. And and I don't understand what rivals in two four seven saw from him that that made him. I mean, there was a camp where he went to the camp was matched up against a bunch of the nation's top linebackers, dominated, and then. That's kind of what why uh, SI All Americans saw that and they're like, wow, this guy's a beast. And they jumped him into the top 50. And then he went down in some other people's rankings who were also there. So I don't know if it was a personal thing. Maybe some folks were mad that he didn't go to Georgia. I don't know what it is. But this is a fun, this is a good football player. And, and this is a kid that that flat out is going to add to the tradition of what Notre Dame is doing. Are you and, and Vince Mitchell Evans is an interesting guy too. He's 6'7, 240. And he, he's never really played a lot of tight end. He played a lot. He almost played like a wide receiver as a junior. And then as a as a as a senior, he didn't catch a lot of passes because he was would have been thrown to himself because he was playing quarterback. <laughs> yeah. And uh six seven quarterback. That's really not really unique prospect. He's one of those, he's one of those boomer bust guys, Vince, where you know he can end up never playing a meaningful snap at Notre Dame, and he can end up being a lot better than I think he is. And a lot of my concern is just I just haven't seen him do it a whole lot. Sure. And, and but he's a really fluid – he's not an explosive athlete, but he's a really fluid, smooth athlete, and I like that. He's got really nice body control. He's 6'7". I just don't know what kind of tight end skills he has. But you don't see a lot of 6'7", 230, 240-pound kids move like him either. And he's got a great frame. And if you look at him, Vince, he looks like he's 12. 
I'm dead serious. Like you look at him in the face. Like in the I face. Got, yeah. There was a picture that got sent out and, and I got sent a couple, a couple photos from some people I know that, that have are connected to the group that's already on campus. And they sent a picture of it. I'm like, who's this kid? And uh, it was a, it was an up close photo. And they're like, that's Mitchell Evans. And I can only see like his face. I'm like, he looks like he's 12 years old and he's just kind of got like a really young body. Well, yeah. the, the reason that's important is because he's already six, seven, two forty. And he had, and, and you know, like Michael Mayer looked like a 23 year old when he showed up on campus, you know, George, this kid's looking like a 13 year old. If you only saw him in the face, you'd be like, he's somebody's little brother. Well, then you yeah. see him in person. You're like six, just towering. I don't think he's quite six, seven. He's listed at six, seven. He looks more like about six, five, you know, maybe six, six, but that's so what he's still really big. Yeah. Right. So you wonder like how much weight is he going to put on? What kind of, what's his body going to look like when he, when he starts growing out? So there's a lot of, question marks with him and, and the reason i didn't rank him as high is because there are so many question marks but yeah, there's talent there there's there's potential there and, and that's what we're going to see if that potential can turn in to something these next couple of years i'd be surprised however if it was in 2021 but being an early enrollee gives him an opportunity to grow up a little bit faster because he is going to get that jump start in all those areas and anytime a guy's an early enrollee i believe he's going to have a chance to to go out and show himself and, and have a chance where when you get to the fall, you're feeling good about the work you did in the spring. And, and then, you know, that leads to him then getting another chance in the fall. Now, Brian, you've been teasing this part of the show pretty much the entire time. Mm-hmm. So it's time to get right into it. Um, we have received some feedbacks that we've heard people talking uh, when, when it, you know, When we bring up the two and three tight end, you know, formations and things of that nature and how people and Brian Kelly and and the coaching staff and how they're they're playing to their strengths. Right. Mm -hmm. You you tend to disagree with the notion that they're playing to their strength in that they're not utilizing their strength. The way Correct. Should. Is that a fair yeah, way to say it? Yes. My issue is not that they use two and three tight ends all the time. Correct. I don't have an issue within that. There's Banner. there's two things that bothered me. One was an, the was narrative related. We kept reading and and you kept hearing questions of Brian Kelly about you know the uniqueness of using two or three tight ends, which I, I even had somebody say somebody there's like the North Carolina game. They had this formation where it was like four tight ends and and. Somebody was like, you, you, you never saw this before. This is such, this is why so-and-so is such a smart such and such because of, and I'm like, I could show you 30 snaps in 2019 and 2018 where they use four tight ends. And like the first was like Duke. Yeah. They had, so I went and found it. And of course that same formation was used in 2019 against Duke, but it was because this narrative had been created in, in the media of, of how unique it was that they were using multiple tight ends. And all that changed was the usage percentage. That's it. I mean, if anything, I think that when you consider the gap in production or the 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 just the li- the the limited production relative to how often they had two or three re- tight ends on the field, to right. me that's problematic. And and we you know I, let's just look at the numbers, right? So in 2018, 2020, the Notre Dame tight ends combined for 68 catches, 724 yards, and two touchdowns. That's 10.6 yards per catch. Last season in 2019, even with Cole Komet missing two games in a 13-game season, they caught 63 passes, so five fewer catches only, 755 yards, so 31 more yards, and that was 12.0 yards per catch and 11 touchdowns. You want to talk about the difference in red zone production of 11 touchdowns versus two touchdowns? It's right there. There it is. So it's like – you're going to talk to me about how it's like this wonderful thing that Notre Dame's using all these two and three tight end alignments. And I'm like, that actually to me limited the offense. And and here's what I mean by that. Just having two, three tight ends on the field does not limit the offense when your tight ends are as talented as the tight ends that Notre Dame has had. My issue all along was, and will continue to be if they're going to continue focusing on this two, three tight end stuff is you can't just use your second and third tight ends as blockers. Because what that necessitates is two things. In the run game, you're going to then all of a sudden start seeing teams, which we saw this year, essentially say when they have three tight ends on the field, really only one of them is a legitimate pass weapon. The other one is kind of a play-action pass weapon. That would have been Tommy Trumbull. And the third guy is not a pass weapon at all. Brock Wright caught three passes for 21 yards last year. So 
I think he had, I'm going to look it up while I'm talking, but I believe he had over 200 snaps played last year. So that means in over in that number of snaps that you your third tight end only caught the ball three times. Imagine if Notre Dame had a receiver <laughs> that played that many snaps and only caught three passes. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm looking at it now. Brock Wright last year played 345 snaps. Avery Davis played 385 snaps. That's only 40 fewer snaps in your slot receiver, and he caught three passes. Right. Now, that's not a Brock Wright complaint. That's an offensive complaint. Yeah, so, no, absolutely. So for, for 345 snaps last year, you had a guy on the field who caught three passes, which tells the defense, you don't have to worry about that guy. Yeah. So now, instead of having five potential skill players that can be pass catchers, you're down to four. And there was a lot of times where, when Tommy, where, where depending on where Tommy Trumbull was lined up, he wasn't going to be a pass weapon. And if he was, it was just going to be on a simple little slide route. There was no wheel routes. From coming from him when he was in an H back alignment, yeah. there was no seam routes, there was no delay. Let the defense go and then just run him on sort of like a delay seam or delay angle route. Like imagine some of the running back routes they've used in the past with their tight ends. They could have or their running backs. They could have used Tommy Trumbull on some of those routes the way that they lined him up and as a wing and a fullback. We saw none of that. So now yeah. at times you're down to three skill players. Yep. Well, then everybody talks about well, well, you don't have you don't have great receivers. Well, if you don't have great receivers, why are you running an offense that requires you to have great receivers to have success in the pass game? Right, because they're only having to defend three people on routes, right. and that makes it a lot harder if you're a right. receiver to get open. And the route combinations that Notre Dame a lot of times uses are routes that require guys to be really good at winning one-on-ones. Now, Javon McKinley was able to do that, but that's not who Ben Skoranek is. Right. So, so now you've limited the effectiveness of Ben Skoranek because you're asking him to play like Chase Claypool and Miles Boykin and Javon McKinley, and that's not who he is. So I don't think they maximized the use of their personnel last year. I, if you're going to play a third tight end for 345 snaps, he needs to catch a lot more than three flipping footballs. Right. And that's my point. And, and, and what that allows defenses to do is say, well, when they're in 13 personnel, the odds of them throwing the ball, period, are decreased. So you can now be more aggressive. We also know that within that – limited passing scope they're going to even be less prone to throw him the ball here uh so that again limits your effectiveness as a pass game but even more so it limits your effectiveness in the run game sure and i'll continue to point this out kyron williams had the lowest yards per rush by a notre dame starting running back since 2014 significantly lower you think about it Dexter Williams is over six yards a carry in 2018. Josh Adams was like six, like 6.4 yards per carry. He was at like seven yards per carry for much of the 20, the 2017 season. In 2016, Josh Adams was at 5.91 yards per carry. And in 2015, CJ Procise was at 6.6 yards per carry. And Josh Adams, when he stepped in the lineup, when CJ went down, was at 7.2 yards per carry. Tony Jones went for 5.95 yards per carry. Kyron Williams went for 5.33. Now, again, we said this in the last show. That's not a Kyron Williams criticism. That's an offensive system criticism because what's happening is when you're in those alignments, they know that you're running the ball seven, eight times out of ten, yep. and they know for a fact that there's one guy that they are not going to throw the ball to. Yep. So now you've made it much easier to defend your offense, which I would say 5.3 yards per carry against those looks was really impressive. Yeah, exactly. So, if you've limited your ability to create some big play opportunities. I mean, if they would have used Brock Wright to catch nine balls, but use that to kind of create some big play opportunities where if you want to put nine, 10 guys in a box, we're going to do this and we're going to, we're going to max pro with, with, with Michael Mayer. We're going to max pro with Tommy Tremble. And we're going to run a wheel route with the one guy you don't think is going to you know catch the ball. Well, Chip Long did that one time in 2019 and it went for a big play and then they didn't use it again. So again, I'll be a little critical of that. But the fact is, is that they played so much two tight end stuff or three and two and three tight end stuff, and they rarely threw to their second and third tight ends. Tommy Tremble had good numbers last year. I mean, for a number two tight end, he had 19 catches. He had eight catches in the first two games. He had 11 catches the rest of the year. Right, in 10 awesome. games, Tommy Tremble had 11 catches. And, and so it was, well, he dropped a lot of balls. He dropped two, dropped two balls. Go count them. He dropped two balls. You know, he had here's was his catch numbers one, 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 three, zero, one, one, two, zero. 
That's that's unacceptable for a guy of his talent yeah, level. Agreed. And 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 not only that, it's unacceptable for a team that uses multiple tight ends that much. Yep. Imagine if your number two receiver was doing that. Right. So so that's the whole point is if you want to use two and three tight ends, I'm all for it. But just Absolutely. because you're using multiple tight ends does not mean you're playing to your strengths because playing to your strengths would require that we're going to be in two, three tight ends a lot more because we're really loaded to that position. Cool. No problem with it. But if you're going to then do that, you better flip and throw them the ball as well or you're going to make yourself much easier to defend. And that's the point. Much easier to defend the Notre Dame offense because of how they use their tight ends or don't use their tight ends. So if they want to keep doing that this spring and heading into next fall, and I'm all I'm I'm fine with it. I'm totally yeah. okay if they want to keep using 12 and 13 personnel. But don't say you're playing to your strengths by doing that because in today's era, it is so much easier to defend teams if you know that two to three of the players on the field are really not weapons to beat you, to burn you. So when you're in a 13, 12 personnel and you've got Ben Skronik on the field or in your 13 personnel, and if you have anyone other than you know Javon McKill in the field, who's really scaring you as a pass threat? Michael Mayer? You know, who who you who you rarely threw the ball way down the field? His all his stuff was short to intermediate. You didn't right. really use him to stretch the field either. You know, you have Tommy Tremble's gonna surprise people at the, at the pro Notre Dame Pro Day. And they're gonna say, why was this guy not used more on vertical routes? Good Great question. question. So that's the thing, is they're gonna have to it, it was a conservative game plan, not a playing to your strengths game plan. Because if you're playing to your strengths, you would have used the similar personnel, but you would have used them far more effectively in my opinion. And that's sort of my issue of saying, well, you know, you're playing to your strengths. This was really smart. No, having a guy on the field who you are not going to throw the ball to as a skill player makes no sense. In, in 2019, Brock Wright played 148 snaps, caught the same amount of passes. That's the thing, Vince. So I want to see this spring, if they're going to start building, if you're going to use more, if you're going to continue using 12 and 13 personnel, are we going to see them start using those guys more as pass weapons? You've got the tools to do it. Your number three tight end, if Taka steps up like you think, Vince, your number three tight end is Kevin Bauman or Kane Barong. Right. Both talented pass catchers. Use them. Yep. And that's what I want to see. So, to me, that's the evolution we need to see from this offense. And, again, you can do it with RPOs. You can do it with play action. You can do it in pure drop. You can do it where you spread them out. A lot of different keep ways teams, to do it. Keep teams off balance. Yep. That's the key. Notre Dame was far pr too predictable last year, and they were still successful. Why? because they had the best offensive line in the country, in my opinion, until Jarrett Patterson got hurt, and their tight ends were studs, and their backs are really good. Now, if you can then protect them with scheme and better protect them with scheme, that's why I'm so confident this offense can take a big, big jump next year. But it's about the talents there, use it correctly. And that means scoring more than 33 points a game because you're utilizing your talent. Brian Kelly's always scared. We can, said we can scheme our way into points. Well, that's I agree. It's time to start doing that at Notre Dame. All right. Well, that's going to do it for our spring preview of the tight end position. So make sure you stay locked in irishbreakdown.com because uh, uh, there's always new and exciting features uh, there. And make sure you hit the subscribe button, the notification button on uh, YouTube, and make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts because we're bringing them to you every day. So uh, for Brian Driscoll, I'm Vince D'Addario. We will talk to you next time on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.